Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to welcome you all to this month's webinar, An Industrial Ecosystem at Work with Dr. Greg Wanger. Dr. Wanger is an experienced research scientist whose career milestones include five years at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, culminating in their optical organics mapper, Sherlock, landing on Mars in February 2021 with the Perseverance rover. Combining a lifelong passion for science and innovation with environmental activism, Greg founded Oberlin AgriScience, Inc. in 2017 to optimize the black soldier fly to produce a premium, nutrient-rich, reliable protein for inclusion in aqua feed, pet food, and livestock feed. He's coming to us from Halifax. Welcome, Dr. Greg. Hi, thank you for this invite and thank you for the opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Um, this is a, it's actually really nice for me to be able to speak in, in this, um, in this session, mainly because we've got a lot of familiarity with Earthshift Global and what they are uh, trying to do and that we've used, um, Nathan and, and his colleagues have, have done our LCAs. And so what I'm hoping to do today is tell you a little bit about what we're doing, but as well as, uh, look at a little bit of LCA data and sort of show you how we're actually making some decisions based on that data. Um, and then I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about what I'm calling our industrial ecosystem. And, and what this is, is a, is a cluster of like-minded companies here in Nova Scotia. We work really well together. We're, we're, we don't compete against each other in, in products or in, in services, but we work really well together. Um, and uh, hopefully I can show you a little bit about that. So I'm going to start with... The big problem that we all have, um, you know, we start off big by saying our food systems for our current planet are on the brink of collapse. I think most of us have seen in the news um, talks about declining soil health, um, as well as our oceans are being overexploited. Um, and this is an area that we alone, Oberlin is not going to solve these problems, but we hope to be a, a part of the solution. So the magnitude of the problem, I think this is where a lot of people get kind of confused and, and don't understand because we talk about food waste and we talk about feeding people. But I think what I've learned a lot in, in working at Oberland and, and dealing with different stakeholders is really the magnitude of the problem. And where we are now is where, you know, we just, we've crested 8 billion people. Uh, I look back here on this graph, and when I was born, we were below four. So we've doubled, uh, the human population has doubled in my lifetime on the planet. And the estimates, as you can see from this data set here, are somewhere north of 10 billion. This is going to happen. No matter what happens, and we hear about um, declining fertility in certain regions, the world will get to 10 billion or above. And so we just need to figure out a way to, uh, well, feed all those people and to um, and just to deal with the, the issues. What has been really interesting in the in the last little while, and since COVID, really has been uh, people's understanding of globalization. I think has really taken and uh, has has ramped up quite a bit. And you know, the pandemic really showed us how vulnerable we are to supply chain disruptions. Um, there's another famous example here of a supply chain disruption that. Um, I guess none of us could have foreseen, but a ship went sideways in the Suez Canal and all of a sudden everyone's toothbrushes and whatever that were coming from China were, were back ordered. So, you know, we're really, we've, we've, we've built resiliency out of our systems and out of our food systems. We have a global conflict right now. I don't know if most people realize that the majority, at least on the East coast of, of North America, the majority of our fertilizer actually comes from Russia um, and Belarus. And so that is a bit of a challenge right now as well. And then where we play in more is the um, the food waste issue. And so this is statistics from Canada. And so the numbers vary, but um, on a whole, we're, we're throwing out somewhere between 40 and 60% of the calories that are produced is lost as food waste somewhere along the supply chain. And this is, this is, I mean, it's a disgusting number, but it's something that we, you, you hear a lot of people talking about, you hear a lot of companies looking, they're striving to lower their food waste, and all of this needs to happen. Where we fit in is there is always going to be food waste that just doesn't meet certain criteria. You know, there's, there's going to be rotten apples and, and, and 
other spoiled foods that just don't really have a good home as of yet. And that's where we fit in. So Overland comes in as a, as a company that looks to disrupt this food waste uh, path and, and upcycle that organic uh, organic waste into usable products. Along the way, we are sort of targeting several areas of uh, our impact um, where, where we see we fit. One is providing um, uh, livestock and um, aquaculture a sustainable a more sustainable feed ingredient um, we do produce a product that is a fertilizer and so we can uh, help deal with uh, soil health i just mentioned food waste being a rampant problem and um, one of the not new things we're working on is actually a bait for lobsters and um, i don't know if people have been following some of the news but um, currently at least on the east coast of canada and in maine Lobster fishing is really reliant on ground fish, such as mackerel and herring and redfish. Those stocks are dangerously low. And so we see we have a role to play uh, potentially in um, offsetting some of those pressures on the ocean. So at the end of it all, Overland, our company, as we scale, we will produce up to 2,200 tons of sustainable protein. Um, we, through our, our, our FRAS product, our fertilizer product, we have the ability to uh, help farmers uh, up to 18,000 acres with regenerative carbon-rich fertilizer. Um, all of this while diverting about 35,000 tons a year of food waste. And as I mentioned too, uh, if we start to look at the lobster bait, we have the, the potential to leave up to 50 million fish in the ocean every year um, for you know, doing what fish do naturally in the ecosystem. So our solution, as was mentioned at the beginning, our solution is to rear the black soldier fly. So the black soldier fly is an insect um, that's being reared around the world now and is actually the number one species of insect that is being reared at commercial scale. Um, the reason for it is it's an incredibly versatile species. Um, it'll eat just about anything. It grows incredibly fast. And so because of that, it has become sort of the dominant species um, to, to grow as a protein source. So one of the, actually the, probably the number one question, and I'm surprised it's not in the Q&A yet, but I haven't gotten that far, um, is are you gonna, are humans gonna eat this? And while I'm not, and our company is not against um, direct to human consumption, that's actually a picture of me eating a cricket at a, at a bugs and beer event when I was living in San Diego. Um, I got no problems eating bugs. I really do think though that Oberlin's role is different. We are here to supply food for our food. I think that is where we have a much better impact than going direct to human consumption. Um, in the in Western society, eating insects is still kind of a taboo. Um, it is changing slowly. The rest of the world already eats insects, and so it's not a huge deal in in, in other parts of the world. But here in 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 uh, North America, we you have to kind of in Europe, you kind of have to get over that ick factor which um, is a challenge, but the salmon love it that we've trialed on, the lobsters seem to love it, my dog loves it. So there's a lot of other opportunities for us to get to market. So I mentioned the soldier fly and, and the main reasons we use the soldier fly is it's incredibly efficient. It's really fast at growing and it allows us to run our facility here as a zero waste production facility. So it, we have a closed loop within our, within our facility here. We rear the entire life cycle of the, of the larva or of the black soldier fly here. And we let about 1% of the larva go all the way through their life cycle because we do need the adults to then mate and lay eggs, but the rest of it all gets diverted to protein. And as I mentioned, as I keep mentioning too, we have this byproduct, which is the worm castings called frass. Uh, that's the polite way of saying poop. Um, the frass becomes a great bio um, uh, fertilizer. And then our only input into the system is food waste. So our current pilot facility runs something like this. We have a feed room where we're bringing in organics. Currently, we're bringing in about three tons of organics per week into our pilot facility. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our scale-up facility, uh, which is uh, under construction right now across the street from where I'm standing right now. Um, but from the feed room, we rear our larvae in, in, in these bins, um, the, the blue trays that you see there. This allows us to, to stack vertically. It allow, essentially, this is vertical farming. Um, in a very small space, we have a, a tremendous impact in, in food production. Our current pilot facility 
um, is the the area that we have where we have these bins uh, is about the size of a tennis court for scale. Uh, so you can kind of get an idea. And it produces the same amount of protein as about 140 acres of corn. So our little tennis court here produces the same amount of protein as 140 acres of corn. From there, we go through packaging. Uh, we're currently sending our uh, most of our product right now is actually being sold live. Um, and I don't know if you can make out on the wall there, there's some critters, uh, hedgehogs and lizards and snakes and dogs and uh, uh, animals like that, that, that are currently our main clients, um, uh, who love eating the, the live larvae, but we do dry it as well and sell that into the wild bird market. Um, and then, um, a lot of that product gets ground and then turned into either dog food or, or, uh, salmon food. And then on the far side, we have got our fly room, and this is where we complete our life cycle. Uh, in those pink areas is where we let our adults uh, mate. The males and females do what they do, and then the female will lay eggs, and that uh, closes the loop within our, our facility. So what's great about the soldier fly is that, um, and uh, and just the, the the state of the world we're in now is there's a bit of a protein crisis, um, and so we have multiple avenues that we can sell in. And so here are some of the the avenues that we're currently uh, dabbling in. So livestock feed, fish feed, lobster bait, and pet foods. And honestly, so when I started so, uh, Oberland in 2017. Fish food was the really the only output for um, for soldier flies in North America. But since then, actually, the pet food industry has taken over as sort of the largest buyer um, and the largest market for us. And then on the other side here, we've got our frass. Uh, so I mentioned zero waste, and so here's just a bit of a uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the with the soldier fly per se is um, you can see the life cycle as they grow. And um, what's amazing about the soldier fly is they grow 8,000 times their size in 10 days. And so from the very left of the screen, it may be right if it's reversed for you guys, but on the, on the left of the screen, you can see the small larvae. When they actually hatch, they are smaller than the period at the end of a sentence. And so they don't actually show up on this, on this chart here. But within 10 days, they've grown 8,000 times their size. Which for comparison, actually one of my employees did a great uh, comparison. It's a human infant to a humpback whale in 10 days. So just so you guys can kind of picture that. Um, and then you can see where our products kind of drop out. So the fertilizer drops out all over the place. Protein is the larger larvae. And then we do end up with two products at the end, uh, which is the dead flies and the shells, which is the cocoon. We then can use those in, as ingredients in other products. Um, and then for just some examples, some gratuitous um, uh, shots of some of the animals and plants that we're feeding. So sa there's a salmon farm we're working with, Sustainable Blue, um, my dog, and some chickens. So the frass side of things is really interesting and something that um, I, I hope that more and more people start to, to realize is that, that where we actually do a, a huge part of our impact is not just the protein side, but actually with the frass. And so we've been running several trials here and have shown that the frass actually has some biostimulant properties and, and promotes, one of the main things it does is it promotes root growth in plants. And it's something to do with the chitin. So I showed in the previous slide, so the chitin that we can sell, which comes out of the dead flies. The chitin is a stimulant that triggers roots to grow more vigorously. And uh, what that does is, is actually makes plants more resilient to drought. And so as the climate is changing now, farmers are facing, you know, not just a warming climate, but we get longer periods of without rain, and then you get a torrential downpour, and then long periods without rain again. And so with frass, we're seeing that we have the ability to weather some of these longer uh, drought periods. And so this is a, a good way for farmers to build resilience into their, into their crops. And then on the far side, we just finished a trial actually that showed the frass actually stimulates uh, particularly strawberries to increase some of their, their the compounds within the strawberry. And these compounds are linked to the flavor density. So it's the sugars and the dissolved uh, dissolved uh, substances within the within the, the strawberry that give it that really rich mouth feel. And so it's kind of nice because we actually grow a tremendous amount of strawberries here in, in Nova Scotia. And uh, so this is a way for us to really help the local uh, the local industries. So Looking at us from an impact perspective, I wanted to just kind of show where we stack up right now. So what what while the the entire time I've run Overland and the, the entire time we've built our pilot, I've always had 
the 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 fact that we have to be an environmentally sustainable friendly company from the from the get-go and this is where we approached uh, nathan and earthshift global to help us um, actually measure where are we on the scale of of things as far as food production goes and so what you can see here is a, a chart which shows some of the the obvious uh, comparators and you can look at where our pilot facility is right now and so this is what i'm standing in right now and boy, we need to do a better job. So we are somewhere between BC net pen salmon and beef. So what, what this allowed us to do now is to really start to think about where are we and what are the impacts that we, the, what are the, the low hanging fruit to try to get us down into the lower left-hand corner of this graph. And so what it meant was because we're we're leasing this building, there's only so many things that I'm one allowed to do or want to do in this building um, because we knew this was only a temporary space. And so that is why I, I, I alluded to the fact that we're building our scale up facility. And so coming very soon is going to be our new large scale facility. This is a hundred and eight thousand square foot facility. So think of it's kind of Home Depot sized. Um, the obvious thing is on the roof, you can see that we've got uh, a very large solar array. Um, we'll actually have one of the largest solar arrays at um, uh, in Nova Scotia. Um, it's one of those things that you hope you get beaten eventually, because I think we need to do more of that. Um, but for now, we'll have one of the largest um, in, uh, in Nova Scotia. What I'm going to show you now is a little video of kind of where we are. So we we bought the land last winter, uh, February of 2022. We began clearing the land in March. Uh, from there, we found out that we have a lot. We had a lot of rock that had to get moved, and so they spent a few months blasting away the rock. Um, we had first concrete on site last August. And then uh, moving through the winter, um, we started forming up the, the slab. And then this was a couple of weeks ago, the wall started going up. And so it's now starting to look like a building. And this was yesterday. So we now have a roof and uh, some offices are taking shape there. So this is something that is happening. We are moving forward um, rapidly. Every day we go over to the site, uh, it seems like we've got new walls. So looking where at where we're headed, if we step back and we look at our LCA, and this was the LCA done by Nathan and his, uh, I think it was just Nathan, but by Nathan, um, is this is our pilot facility. So this is that number that put us up in the upper right of that graph between salmon and beef. And so what you can see is there are two glaring um, sections of this chart, which are the low hanging fruit. One is heat so the soldier fly is a semi-tropical uh, species and so we constantly have to keep our facility here at about 27 28 degrees for those of you south of the border that's 82 um and um so you know being nova scotia and being cold for a lot of the year um having a facility at 28 degrees um really does require um external heat sources and then the what actually the biggest thing that we had was drying our product into the powder. We had a very inefficient um, drying technology that um, really drove the, the carbon footprint of our current facility. And so, as I said, these became the low hanging fruit for where we started the conversation. Then the question became, how low can we go? So here is kind of what we're doing in the new facility. So we will be producing somewhere between 900 and a, uh, 900 and 1,000 kilowatts of power of our own on the roof. We'll be making up the, the rest of the power that we need on cloudy days or on uh, at night with locally generated wind. And this is wind that is specifically designated for us and other companies like us. This is not power that's just sort of dumped into the grid that comes from northern Quebec or whatever. This is uh, dedicated very close by to us here. We made some decisions on the envelope of our building because we know we have to be uh, a, a warmer than, than outside. And so we've done things like go from an R40 to an R70 roof. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it saves us almost 60,000 kilowatt hours a year in electricity. One of the most novel things that we're doing actually is we are using the fact that our insects 
the body heat of our insects, every one of those blue bins that I showed you before that's stacked up there, every one of those blue bins produces about 60 watts of heat, which in our current facility where we have 100 bins really doesn't make a huge uh, heap of difference. But in our new facility, we will have 10,000 bins. And all of a sudden, 10,000 times 60 watts becomes a very large number that you actually have to deal with. And a lot of other insect farms will just flare that heat outside because they need to get rid of it. What we're doing here is we're recapturing that heat and we're using that heat in the rest of our building. So we're using it to heat our domestic hot water. We're using it to heat the radiant floor heat of the rest of the building. And what that allows us to do is dramatically reduce our energy requirements to keep our building going. And so you can see the heat recovery system alone will drop our energy production or consumption by about 10 million kilowatt hours a year. The uh, high efficiency product processing, we have now, we've spent a lot of mental effort looking for drying technology that is not the same as, as the one that uh, we were currently using. And so we found a drying technology that will drop our production um, down to about, uh, by about 18.6 million kilowatt hours a year. And so here, this is using Nova Scotia grid. Um, uh, you could see the uh, equivalent reductions in CO2 if we were to uh, buy uh, power off of the Nova Scotia grid. So where does that put us now? So here you can see on the left is our pilot facility, uh, which is where we were up in the upper right corner of that graph. The scale-up facility, you can see the decisions we're making dramatically increase our carbon or our, our, our efficiency. And then when we go to green power, as we're doing here, uh, you can almost not see us on this graph. And so this is something that, that we at Overland are really proud about. It's this race to the bottom of this graph. Just so you guys can, can actually see the, the scale, I've removed the pilot facility now because it's off the scale. Um, and so here you can see how we stack up. Peruvian fish meal is, is Nathan chose mainly because that is typically what we are compared against because that is what we're displacing in aquaculture feed and other, and other sources like that. We're typically displacing uh, fish meal. And so that's why that's there as a comparison. So where do we stack up now? So Overland Grassy Lake, the Grassy Lake is the name of the facility that we're, we're calling it because it's on Grassy Lake Road. Um, but we are now at the bottom. And I have yet to find a lower impact, a lower carbon footprint protein source on the planet. So, and I've looked. Um, so this is something that we're really proud of. This is this is this is what it takes, and 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 the decisions we're making to get us to that bottom left-hand corner of this graph. So now that's that's Overland. So Overland is, you know, we're striving to be the lowest carbon footprint protein on the planet. We're striving to do it right. We're striving to make decisions on water use, energy use, transportation, all that stuff. And a lot of that really came out of the work that Nathan did. It really opened my eyes to where we were bad and where we needed to improve. So now I want to talk a little bit about our ecosystem of companies. And so um, here's a cluster of companies. Uh, I'll go through a little bit of detail of what they all are but we work incredibly well together and we've been working together for about three or four years now to see how our, our companies integrate either with waste products or with um, human resource capital, um, uh, with energy and heat transfers and, and all that kind of stuff. And so um, from the top left, we have Small Food. Small Food is a single cell protein company. So they grow an algae or it's not really an algae, but they grow a, something like an algae uh, for the protein market. Sustain Tech uh, is, an, is a very advanced recycling company here. Um, Sustainable Blue is uh, the world's only zero discharge land-based salmon farm. Uh, Scaldeer is a company that takes um, the fish guts and actually and, and heads and bones and stuff and takes them uh, into a value-added product. Oberlin, that's us. Um, RO Carbon is a, uh, a brand new company um, that actually is looking to help us monetize our carbon credits. Um, and so we're all working together and this is kind of how it works. So starting at the top, we have municipal waste and organics. This is typically the stuff that comes out of back or grocery stores. Eventually we're gonna start taking just our green bin waste. That goes through Sustain Tech, where they actually then split that waste and peel out all the stuff that we don't want, the plastic, the metal, 
um, the really woody bits, um, sticks and twigs and, and chopsticks and all that stuff that, that really the soldier fly doesn't want. The processed organics then come to Oberland and they become the base of the feed for our, for our larvae. The protein then moves down to sustainable blue. Along the way, we bring in small food and their algal protein, which helps boost the nutrient quality of the, of the salmon food. And at the end, what you end up with is a very uh, tasty, low carbon, uh, environmentally friendly salmon that is at the market. Adding on to that, we take the racks and viscera um, from, the, from the salmon as they're being processed. That goes to Scaldir, becomes the value added products. So omegas and other protein sources that then feed back into the pet food industry or others. And then each of us has a, a byproduct or, a, or another product that we can combine. And we've been working uh, with um, some local farmers to add this back into the fields to see, can we help them um, sort of uh, achieve a more regenerative agriculture practice? And at the very end of it all, all of this, all of the flow of materials, all of the energy inputs and outputs that are happening at each of our companies are all being measured by RO Carbon. So for instance, at Oberland, RO Carbon will own our electric meter. The data goes to RO Carbon first. They get first crack at it. And what that does is it, pro it, it, it proves to the people that, that, that RO Carbon is dealing with that the data have not been manipulated, that the data are um, tractable and, and valid. And so that's something that's really interesting is now we almost like you have an accountant uh, we uh, we have a carbon a third party carbon accountant as well. So this is uh, a little bit about now a couple examples of how our ecosystem is actually working together. And so we've got a couple projects here. So uh, looking at the ecosystem, we we do need some naming uh, some help in naming our projects. So we have our superfish project, and this is um, a project where we've been taking. As I mentioned, the, the soldier fly from Overland and the algal protein from small foods, and we've been feeding salmon. And so here is some soldier fly being fed to some baby salmon uh, at Sustainable Blue. And, you know, the proof's in the pudding. I'm really happy that they love it, which is good. It uh, would have been a much more boring video if they wouldn't have liked it. So um, the salmon love it. We're actually just entering phase three of our fish trial. So we started out with small fish like this, but we are now growing fish from one kilo, so two pounds up to full market weight, four kilos or eight pounds. And that trial is gonna start within the next couple of weeks. The data from our first two, two trials show that the salmon are growing as well or better using our products than they are on conventional feeds. And it's one of the things that, that for um, Sustainable Blue, feed is a, a big portion of their uh, impact, uh, uh, environmental impact. Then moving on, we have what we call our super soil project. And so this is where we've taken the waste products or the byproducts of our uh, three companies, and we've started doing some growth trials. So we've done now three or four different growth trials. On the At the top, you can see some lettuce trials and Actually, what is really amazing is S4, which was treatment four, which is a 30-30-30 mixture of the three of our, our products. Um, that grew better, that grew 32 times better than the control lettuce, like tremendously good growth rates. Um, in fact, the person who ran this trial didn't want to show us the data because he said, you're going to take that and all you're going to talk about is the 32x um, growth in, in, in lettuce. But on the bottom here, we've also done cabbage trials. Um, as I've showed before, we've got some strawberry trials. We've done a whole bunch of other things too. So what we're really doing is building a, an archive of, of all the different vegetables and, and where, we, where we play well and where we do well. And finally, this is something that was kind of new and a, an opportunity for us. This is what we're called our super fuel. You can notice the theme here. Sustain Tech, which is that advanced recycling company, one of the things that they do is when they split out the plastic from garbage and municipal waste, instead of sending some of that stuff to recycling, which honestly ends up in landfill, if, we are, if we're really honest with each, with each other, most of our plastic is currently ending up in landfill, they de deconstruct that plastic back down to its constituent molecules. They can then send that, that, um, that product 
right back into the plastics industry and make new plastic. So this is not really recycled plastic. It's making new plastic from the constituents of old plastic. And they get another product, which is a fuel product. And so we were actually their first customer. I mentioned, I showed that heat, uh, because of our oil uh, usage, was one of our largest carbon footprints at our current facility. And so we were the first client to actually test their second product as a heating oil. And so we have been heating this facility here off of the waste plastic from Nova Scotia that has been going, instead of going to landfill, has been coming here to heat. It's not the best thing to do with, with plastics. I, ideally, we shouldn't be burning them at the end of the day, but that's what they're working on now is to actually get rid of this product and send it all back into new plastics. So it's kind of a very exciting time for, for this ecosystem. So our impact, so as the three companies here, our impact on agriculture, we have the 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 output of our facilities, our, our scale-up facilities, we have the ability to um, help up to 120,000 hectares, so almost 250,000 acres of agriculture thrive under regenerative practices. So we can remove the, 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 the demand and the use of chemical-based fertilizers. Our impact on aquaculture is another interesting one. So this is the LCA that was done by Nathan as well uh, on sustainable blue. And so what you can see is um, on the left is RAS, which stands for recirculating aquaculture system. So that's what sustainable blue is, producing 5,000 tons of salmon per year. And so the carbon footprint is if if they did it as is as as if they were doing it currently is that, so about 8,500 uh, tons of CO2 for 5,000 tons of, of production. If they go green, so one of the biggest problems we have in Nova Scotia is that our grid is one of the dirtiest in Canada. And so the best thing we can all do as companies is get off Nova Scotia's grid. And so by um, Sustainable Blue going to green power, they essentially cut their carbon footprint in half. Adding in the ecosystem and an ecosystem product, so that is the soldier fly and the materials from small foods, you can see we have a small but marked effect on, um, on the carbon footprint of the uh, uh, salmon uh, produced at Sustainable Blue. And so when we look at this uh, uh, in, as a whole, in comparing it to BC net pen salmon here, you can see that Going green drops their carbon footprint by about 47%. Using us as a feed ingredient instead of fish meal drops them by an additional 15%, which overall is a 39% reduction from net pen aquaculture. And one of the biggest criticisms that, that land-based aquaculture has been getting is that they have a tremendous, like at face value, they have a much higher carbon footprint because of their um, the power demands. They have a lot of pumps and a lot of filters that they need to run. And so that drives up their carbon footprint. But you can see that Sustainable Blue making sustainable decisions uh, with their company, the same way that Overland made decisions with its company, can actually drop their carbon footprint below net pen aquaculture. So this is a game changer um, for, the, for, the, for the industry, really. What this all means and what we actually do is we meet as a group, um, our, our little ecosystem, we meet as a group almost every week to start discussing like similar problems that we're all having, um, ways that we've solved, uh, the ways that we've solved problems with the goal of as we all scale um, and decide that we're going to build additional facilities either across North America or wherever we go is we're good as companies working together here in Nova Scotia. We are incredibly good and very, very um, efficient if we actually locate and co-locate next to each other. Because of all the things that we've talked about, you know, us sending protein to Sustainable Blue, there's other things that can be traded if you are uh, within close proximity to each other. Sustainable Blue actually produces a lot of waste heat. Um, you wouldn't think that a salmon farm does that, but they're constantly chilling their water because the salmon like to be at a, at a stable, lower temperature of water. That heat has to go somewhere. Right now, they're flaring it out. Uh, they're just venting it into the atmosphere, but that is uh, relatively easily sent across the, 
um, uh, across to us where we do have a, a higher heat requirement. Uh, electricity, for instance, our solar, when we have excess, we can send that to Sustainable Blue. Feed goes across to Sustainable Blue. And you can see the synergies here with these companies. And so we are actively looking now for land across North America where we can put what we're calling our campus model. The campus model goes deeper than just this. I mean, we are, as companies now, we're actively sharing um, HR. We're, we're actively sharing personnel. Um, we're using the same IT guru um, to structure our IT here at Overland as is being done at Small Foods and other companies like that. As we grow and scale, what makes RO Carbon's job a lot easier if our systems are already geared to talk to each other so that we don't end up saying, hey, we, we're located next door to each other and we, we have kind of the Windows Mac problem that you know doesn't really communicate well. So we're doing that all now at our pilot scales and we're putting in this infrastructure so that when we do go to the large scale, we're ready to go and, and you know day one, we're gonna be a tremendously efficient uh, cluster of companies. And so I think at that, I will leave it and answer some questions. Thank you, Sorry. Greg. That was so very interesting and impressive. And now to ask the audience's questions, we have our Director of Analytical Services, Nathan Ayer, who did the work on this. Ask them for you. Perfect. Thanks, Holly. Thank you, Greg. What a great presentation. So nice to see all the work you're doing to bring the data into action and decision making. We, As people who do LCA, we could never ask for anything more exciting. So <laughs> great, great to see that. There's a number of questions coming in. I think we should get right into that. Sure. Uh, we have time. The first question was reflecting back on if you could comment on the types of organics that the black soldier fly are feeding on. And sure. I, I have a follow up question after you respond to that that's related. Sure. Maybe if I uh, I'll hopefully read between the lines and answer yours at the same time, we'll <laughs> see. Um, so the type of organics that they feed on. So that is one of the real benefits of the soldier fly is that it'll eat almost any organic. Um, so it doesn't like woody materials. So twigs and sticks and stuff like that are no good. But anything from rotten vegetables to grass clippings to um, we've tried every organic that I could get my hand on here in Nova Scotia. And honestly, the only thing it really didn't like was we tried the sludge that came out the back end of a pulp mill. So this is a very noxious, um, disgusting slurry that a pulp and paper mill is trying to get rid of. Um, we tried to grow them on that and they didn't like it. So that's kind of where it ends. On the other end, we fed it all sorts of stuff, all sorts of waste products here um, in, in Nova Scotia. What we're allowed to do right now in North America, um, FDA and CFIA rules, we are limited right now to what's called pre-consumer organic waste. And so this is stuff that comes out of a processing facility or a grocery store or restaurants and things like that. So that's really what, um, what we're focusing on. Um, in the future with Sustain Tech's help, I, I hope that we'll be able to take post-consumer organics and that is our green bin waste because that's really where we should be focused on. Great, and, and so my related question is you know in the LCA we made some assumptions about what that what the feed input was for the black soldier fly. Yeah. As you scale up, as other you know there's there are other um, organizations trying to address you know waste food issues. Do you foresee as you scale up and as the industry scales up any pressure on your preferred feedstock for the black soldier fly? And do you think that might change the environmental performance at all if you're forced to adapt to different inputs? So I think the answer is yes. What is interesting is that there is now starting to be competition for uh, the feedstock. Um, what we're do working with here is we're working with um, some of the partners that that deal in the organics that have been trucking it around for, for years. And we are we are starting to create what we what we're calling sort of a hierarchy because there are certain food stocks or feedstocks that of course, the soldier fly will eat a perfectly good apple, but we shouldn't be bringing in those apples. We should be letting those apples go to other higher value uh, outputs. And then at the very bottom, we've got compost and anaerobic digestion, which is taking its chunk right now. The soldier fly fits in the middle, and that's kind of where the bulk of the material is right now. And so we we see that we've got plenty to deal with, to, to handle right now. 
What is going to change is as we start to monetize this, right now this waste is waste, but it's going to change relatively soon that people are going to say, hey, you actually need our byproduct. So it's no longer a waste. We're going to call it a byproduct and we're going to charge you for it. And then you're actually going to have a market and we'll see how things develop um, on that. Um, and honestly, that makes it people are going to spend a lot more effort and mental effort thinking about how to do this properly if you put a price on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, two, there was two related questions wondering if you could expand a little bit on what Sustain is doing. I think you later in the presentation, you commented on that a bit, but yep. the, the questions were what, what is Sustain doing in particular yep. and was, was Sustain's, were Sustain's activities included in the LCA work? That's a good question. I don't think uh, sustains uh, were included in the LCA. If I remember correctly, you looked at just us taking uh, local materials. Um, but what sustain does for us is as we move to more complicated and, and as we move into post-consumer organics, one of the challenges that we have is that people throw all sorts of crap into their green bins that really they shouldn't be. But we're lazy as a species and we don't really think twice about it. So we throw out uh, you know, a spoon or we throw out garbage that should be going to landfill or should be going to recycling, ends up in our green bins. What sustains advanced recycling does, is, and really what they are as an advanced separation company, is they have about 18 different separation steps in their magic box, is that they have the ability to peel off the plastics and peel out the, the organics that we don't want, the woody materials and the metals and all that stuff. They go to their... Um, uh, wherever they go, metal goes to recycling, uh, plastic, as I said, has its outputs, but then the feed comes through and that becomes us. So they are, for us, is a way for us to clean the feed so that we can actually petition FDA and CFIA to start allowing us to take, excuse me, post-consumer organic, because that's, honestly, I think that's where our role should be, but we're limited by the government right now to say pre-consumer. So, yeah. Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, Here's a question relating to the financial side. So the, the comment is that the renewable energy and other innovations you've included are great from an environmental perspective. They, these probably come with a higher initial cost over traditional technologies. Do you expect to see any monetary benefit from these over time? Yeah, so that's a really good question because it does. I mean, I can see why companies make the decision to put off some of these decisions because um, like for instance, our solar array is about a million and a half to a million, million, $1.6 million. Our, our HVAC system that I, uh, the very fancy schmancy HVAC system is very high six figures or seven figures, sorry. Um, and when you see it at the, when you first get the quotes, I mean, it is, there's some sticker shock there. Um, but when you actually sit down to do the math, our heat recovery system pays itself back in 1.8 years. So Yes, there's an initial high initial upfront cost. The payback is now is 1.8 years. That's tremendously good. On top of that, what we have, and we have actually not put it, we're just now starting to figure out how to put this into our financial model, is RO Carbon is using our data, the current data that we're getting from our pilot and the projected data we have at our upscale facility, and they are pre-selling our, or, or attempting to pre-sell our carbon credits for ne the next several years. What this does is it gets us an inflush of capital within the next quarter or two, let's call it next two quarters, to allow us to buy and purchase some of this equipment, to offset some of the costs of this equipment. So we're pre-selling our carbon credits allowing us to buy this expensive equipment now and not delay because the the you know for Canada to meet its net zero goals by 2030 honestly we're never going to do it but um the only way to do it is companies need to have capital now not 10 years from now and so that's where RO carbon fits into this whole ecosystem excellent thank you so <clears throat> here are a couple of questions about the ecosystem um a question, if you could comment briefly on just how you got started as a group of companies, then what do you see as some of the bigger barriers or challenges that, you, that you've overcome to, to move it forward? And then I have a related question to that after you respond. 
Sure. So how did we all get together? Actually, it was really interesting as we've got a few um, uh, investors that are that are uh, shared amongst our companies. And, and what we've been doing for the last several years is about once or twice a year, we do these tours. Um, we call them eco tours, but it's essentially a tour of the companies. And what it allowed us to do is, is when you do the tour and you actually you, you move from Overland to Sustain to Sustainable Blue to Small Foods, it really starts to make sense and it starts to gel the idea and the concept of what we're trying to do. Um, and then it just came to the point where we were it was required for us. We just started sitting down together on a, on a sort of weekly basis to sort of hash out some of these details. We all like each other as a, you know, like all the CEOs and people involved are all really nice people. And so they're great to hang out with and just really uh, talk about some of these problems. So that's been easy. Um, the challenges have been that like we do face the, the the reality of we're all independent companies and we're all trying to get our, our, our scale ups and our pilots going. So it's a time and effort kind of issue. And what I'm finding interesting is is you know, we've done tremendous amount of work and, and we have a lot to show for what our ecosystem can do. And this is for companies that like work well together. We all like each other. There's no competition per se. Um, and we still have these challenges of, you know, everyone's got their own path forward. I can, I can only see why this is so difficult for companies where either you're bigger or um, you're you're coming at this later when you're already more well established. It it becomes difficult to integrate. Um, so we're kind of lucky in that we're all sort of scaling kind of at the same at the same time, and the the CEOs and and leaders of all the companies have the same ethos, right? So that's been sort of a, a relatively easy, yeah. Great. And then just related to that, because we talked about the the organic waste being a key input upfront for Oberland. Do you feel any, do you have any concern about um, if we see a drop in organic waste generation or availability in future years, are there any concerns for the Oberland model and for the, the ecosystem model as a whole, or have you looked ahead at something like that? For sure, and that's why we're innovating with Sustain, right? Because, the idea is that as companies, because honestly, Walmart and Sobeys and um, uh, Trader Joe's, thinking about south of the border, right? They would rather sell you an apple. They don't want to throw that apple out. So they're doing whatever they can to, in their supply chains, minimize the food waste once it gets to the grocery store. And 100% they should do that. There is still going to be the apple core and the banana peel and the rotten apple that someone forgot in the bottom of their fridge. That's why we are really trying, and, and together with Sustain Tech, is we are really trying to push the envelope to allow the Canadian government to start allowing us to take post-consumer organic. For every ton of pre-consumer organic, there's probably 30 or 40 tons or more of post-consumer organic. That's really where we should be playing, and that's why we're continuing to push the envelope to allow us into that space, because that's really where... I mean, where we should be playing and also where the volume of, of uh, food, feed, food waste is. And that is not going to reduce as dramatically, I think. Um, it still can. And honestly, if it gets cut in half, then there's still plenty. Um, we throw it away a lot of food. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, 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 you talked about how one of your primary customers would be salmon feed. And there's a question I'm wondering if you could just comment briefly on what is the typical feed that salmon are eating when yep. when Oberlin is not available. Sure. So a typical salmon feed, it depends. There's two models. There's the model that Sustainable Blue is using currently, um, which is they have an entirely marine-based diet. So all the constituents of their diet are, are uh, the majority is fish meal and fish oil. Um, Sustainable Blue uses a lot of uh, their their salmon feed uses the uh, byproducts from other fisheries. So the so the the um, offcuts of the the herring and or sorry flounder and halibut industries as well. So that gets ground into a pellet, and that's what Sustainable Blue uses. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the the uh, typical salmon feed. They're kind of racing to the bottom for price, and what a lot of the inputs into those feeds are land based, uh, like soy and corn and and other products on that side of things. And so, what you see is you see more and more land being diverted 
and the protein and the products actually being now diverted into aquaculture feeds. Um, so it doesn't really solve the problem, right? You just have moved from taking land or from taking ocean resources, you're now taking land resources to feed our salmon. And honestly, the from a health perspective, uh, salmon don't typically eat soy. And so there's been a lot of research to show that some of these diets are actually quite detrimental to the health of the salmon. Um, and so moving away from corn and soy back to a, a more natural diet. And in fact, so insects, I mean, in nature, insects would be a, a major portion of a salmon's diet when they're in the rivers. So us feeding insects to the salmon is not that far out in left field. In fact, it's approaching a much more natural diet than, than what they're currently being fed. Great. Now, if we can reflect back on what the soldier fly eats, uh, a couple of questions about uh, potential sources for them. Um, the first is, can you mentioned the sludge from pulp and paper, um, but could black soldier flies be grown using biosolids from public wastewater treatment? Yep, absolutely. And we've we've had a project going on here in Nova Scotia, working with a local municipality to see if we can help them knock down the volume of their of their uh, biosolids. Um, in other parts of the world, uh, so that's a really difficult one for us to actually get to market. You know, if we can't take post-consumer organics, the Canadian government isn't going to allow us to feed sewage to our soldier flies. Doesn't mean it can't, right? So if there's the science side of things, and then there's the regulatory side. Science says absolutely you can do it. The regs say no. Um, in fact, in Africa, a lot of uh, soldier fly operations in Africa do feed biosolids. And what's nice for them is that the soldier fly outcompetes other insects, such as house flies and tsetse flies. And so you actually, you know, not only are you solving a manure or a, or a biosolids pro uh, problem, you're actually knocking down other insect species, which are vectors of disease. And so for a region, it's actually, you kind of get a, a, a double whammy of benefit. And a, a related question, what about uh, digestate from anaerobic digestion? Is that a possible input? It's a possibility. Um, we actually have a large anaerobic digester here in Nova Scotia that we're working with um, as well to see about that. Um, interestingly enough, and, and it's on the feed put, the, the input side of things, so anaerobic digesters need organics to, to work, and so they're competition to us. But it's, it's interesting in that what uh, where we get the best growth performance in our soldier fly is typically with vegetable matter, so apples and stuff like that. Um, and that's uh, those products actually don't produce a lot of biogas. And so it's what the anaerobic digester would rather not get are the, is the material that we prefer. And so we actually work quite well synergistically for uh, uh, taking different different components out of the organic stream. Great. Um, so two questions that are kind of related to one another. Do you know of other ecosystems, industrial ecosystems like this that were purposely designed to work together from the outset? And related to that, how do you see this campus model scaling, for example, in other locations? Huh. I guess, I mean, Nathan, you did send me some papers back in the day about sort of other concepts like this that typically in Europe and places like that where they, you know, the waste heat of one industry. I know my family comes from Liechtenstein, a tiny little country, and I know that you can actually buy steam heat from other companies um, to heat your home. And so there are, of course, this is not the new model. I think trying to incorporate as many companies as we have from the outset is maybe a little bit different. Um, and so I'm not sure. I hope there are. I mean, this is like one of those things that we should we should all be doing. I mean, we should all be thinking about who our neighbors are and can we be sharing things. Um, how do we see a scaling? Well, so um, uh, Sustainable Blue just signed a letter of intent with the state of Washington to um, look at the feasibility of putting a facility, a sustainable blue facility out in Washington state. And we are actively talking as well uh, with sustainable blue about, you know, make sure you leave six or eight acres of land beside you because we're gonna need that too. And so we are actually looking to, to possibly expand um, as a unit. Um, what's nice about that is that um, from shovel break, uh, breaking ground, um, we're up and running before Sustainable Blue is up and running. And so, um, you know, if they decide to go somewhere, we can we can come in on their coattails and, and put up a facility um, 
uh, as well. And so that's kind of how we see this moving forward. Um, sustain the, the 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 issue is, or the great thing is, is that w the the things that our companies solve are kind of location agnostic. Um, you know, protein and salmon are being sold across North America, so it really doesn't matter where you are. Sustain tech, there's garbage and organics everywhere. And then for us to kind of plunk ourselves in the middle of the two, it, it's it's kind of a no brainer to to see that uh, when where one goes, the rest will follow. And, and related to that, in terms of scaling up and working in different locations, do you do you think there's any potential change in the environmental performance that's been measured for this initial analysis as you get bigger or as you as you set up in different geographic regions? Are there any key drivers that you think might affect environmental performance? I mean, location will be one, but I think what, what it is, and, and you can kind of see from our, our building, is that what I hope doesn't happen is that we don't have the pressure for the next facility to say, well, all that all the wing dazzers that you put into the new facility, like let's just set those aside, right? And go with conventional um uh ventilation, go with conventional water, like heating of water. And I, I hope that whoever is is in charge of these next decisions, presumably it'll be me if it's Oberlin for the next foreseeable future, right? I'm not gonna let those decisions happen because honestly, the what what you what the output in capital at the very beginning is paid back so quickly that it, it seems like a no-brainer. Like the, these, these heat recovery systems, yes, they're very expensive, but at 1.8 years recovery time or uh, uh, time to recoup the costs, it, it's a no-brainer. And so we as companies, like we all see this moving forward and we all really do believe in what we're doing and trying to be the best we can be and continually improve what we're doing. Um, so I, I don't see that we're, I really hope um, I, I, that we're going to, you know, backtrack on our on our on our morals and vision. Great. There's just one final question. When you chose the black soldier fly, was did you consider any other insects alongside? We did. Yeah, we actually started with uh, soldier fly and crickets here in in our facility, and because crickets are another one of the main species that are grown uh, commercially around the world, um, they're a pain in the butt. I mean, they jump. They they got into the they got into everything. I mean, we had crickets. We got rid of them eventually after about six months of trying, and it took another year to get rid of the crickets out of the facility. I mean, it, it really is a pain in the ass. The other real downside to crickets is crickets are not as versatile in the types of feed that you can feed them. So crickets do require, and a lot of big cricket operations are feeding their crickets. Um, wheat bran and uh, chick mash and things like that, that honestly, I think you should be feeding chicken feed to chickens and not rearing crickets on chicken feed only to then feed those crickets to the chickens. It doesn't make any sense to me in that sense. And so um, the soldier fly is really the best. There's one more question. Um, question around whether you pre-process your feedstock material before introducing it to the larva. Um, we do. Uh, we've got a, a. We have two steps that we do. One I can tell you about, and the other one I can't. So the one that I can tell you about is we typically grind everything to a very fine paste. Um, it, it helps us downstream to split the split the frass and the and the the soldier fly based on size. So from an industrial perspective, it's just easier for us to get the food, all the food, really really small, and then um, the soldier fly prefers to eat it that way. The other what we do here is we have a, a way of stabilizing our feed so that we can stockpile feed on site without the use of refrigeration or any other technologies like that. So that's a bit of pre-processing that we do. I would recommend that whatever you're doing at, uh, in Rochester, um, grinding your feed um, even, even somewhat uh, would help you a lot. Well, thank you both for a very interesting and wonderfully put together presentation and this webinar and good luck to you all in the future thank you so much thank you greg